Hello, everyone, and welcome to my interview. And I'm always excited about every single interview I'm having, but today is something special. Why? Because the uh, person I'm going to speak with, Dr. Bob Rakowski, has this ability to talk to its, his patients and hopefully to everyone who is uh, watching from a clinical perspective. But he has also amazing scientific uh, background and everything he says has logic behind, but has also an art to it. And I love the art and science of what we are trying to achieve here. And before, a few days before, uh, Dr. Bob texted me and he said, what is your goal, Daria, for this uh, podcast? And um, that is goal but that is also my mission and vision that today this podcast is further improving and understanding and educating female in this stage from 35 up this perimenopausal moment which can start at the, any moment of that time up to menopausal stage and postmenopausal stage i want to empower them to to educate to don't listen mainstream media we can go through those stages in in and flourish and nourish and booming and achieve anything we want but we have to enter in those stages with this optimum health to give which is going to give us ability to perform well and because dr bob has lots of access to work with athletes and i used to be athlete and i want that every woman op be optimal as the best athlete right we have good athletes and bad athletes but those top premium people are really caring about cell biology and how this improving the performance and the physical being and mental being so that was short from me now i'm going into dr bob hi bob and welcome well happy beautiful day and I'll, I'll tell you what that introduction was so powerful and you really broke it down to what people need to know if you pay attention to the small stuff to the cellular biology the cells are going to work together beautifully to make healthy tissues organs systems and a healthy life. And you did throw in body, mind, and spirit. So you're very complete and I'm honored to be your guest today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, your Instagram is growing. The numbers of views is growing. I have been uh, observing this, but uh, it is not about social media popularity. You have amazing clinic right that is running for many years you helped so many people you work with athletes uh you work with general population and um, that's you know most of practitioners do you you are having this privilege of working with top people which is interesting because like i said we can borrow from them and apply a little bit to uh, us to be mm, the best version of, in that case, of female. <laughs> right, let's talk about feminine power and empowerment here. How did you start your career? How did you enter into this amazing field, really? Well, it was a near-death experience, interestingly enough. You know, mm -hmm. I was studying electrical engineering. I, I had a scholarship, you know, supposedly I was going to be very good at math and science, but I got hurt playing football when I was in college, American football, not European football. Uh, and, you know, I went to the medical doctor. I got muscle relaxers and painkillers. I didn't pay any attention to the prescriptions. I really didn't like taking pills, but I went out on a date and I had one drink. I fell asleep behind the wheel of my car. Uh, and, you know, I, I would have died if my date did not grab the wheel and, and shake me. And, you know, I got over to the side of the road and she said, what happened? I said, I don't know. I just passed out. And she said, well, I need to drive home. I said, well, that's a really good idea. When I got home, I picked up the bottle of pills that I probably should have read in the first time. It said, don't mix with alcohol, don't operate heavy machinery. Uh, and I realized, wow, this almost killed me. So I threw the pills away and I went back to the gym and I started trying to rehab myself. And someone said, you know, you really need to go see a good chiropractor. And I didn't even know what a chiropractor was, but I saw Dr. Michael Wickers in the early 1980s and I realized that if you align the body, if you nourish the body, if you take the stress out of the body, the, the fundamentals of functional medicine, you can help people overcome most things. Occasionally medicine is needed, but most things, functional medicine or lifestyle medicine can solve the challenges. 
Right, and <clears throat> that's what I love that you stressed out in this last sentence, that there is a space for conventional medicine. And my goal as a, a practitioner um, um, in nutritional therapy, functional medicine um, application in, of nutrition, um, plus the other stuff I, I'm doing, it's always to uh, tell my patients or my clients, uh, we are not trying to be better. We try and integrate both worlds because every there is a space for it, right? But we know that uh, in this this practice, the first is not to harm and is nourish the terrain. So the terrain dictate what further is going to happen with our DNA, right? Is is our epigenetic that dictates if we're going to get disease or no? And most of people unfortunately lives in this crazy environment. Um, full of toxins and everything else that you also always can throw into hormones, right? Because that's what is going to be kind of lead in around our uh, topic uh, today. What are the most common problems women um, uh, in age 40 or 35 experiencing when they transitioning from this, from this adult life, you know, hormones functioning, kind of okay, let's say PCOS is a out of norm, right? Going into perimenopause and then they have to transition into the menopause. What are the most common problems here? You observe. You know, I want to actually back off a little bit and start about the process. So it's amazing when a, when a little female baby is in utero, in the fetus, she's estimated to have somewhere around 7 million eggs in her ovaries. By the time she's born, she's down to about 3 million. By the time someone it, it reaches the age of 37, they tend to be down to about 25,000 eggs. And then by age 52, the eggs are no longer there. And so the ovaries, starting at puberty, start producing wonderful amounts of hormones, estrogens, progestins. But as the ovaries start to decline in their reserve of, of uh, eggs, they also decline in hormone production. So those numbers drop and drop and drop. But here's the interesting thing. We now know that there's a term called intrachronology. Endocrinology is a broadcast message. It's the ovary sending messages to the whole body with estrogens and progestins. But beginning uh, in the 30s, intrachronology takes over. The body starts making hormones, the cells that need it, make it from a molecule called DHEA, which is actually made from the adrenal glands. So every cell of your body, every cell of my body that needs the hormones can make it from DHEA. And, and what I tell people, and it's you know one of my jokes, but I don't know why they call it menopause because women get it too, but men have a similar decline. They call it andropause and we both transition to more of what's known as intrachronology, but we've got to keep the adrenal glands healthy and really the whole body healthy to keep these hormones working as they should and being produced as they should. But the more common challenges, you know, sometimes people, uh, you know, women can have loss of libido. They can have change in body composition. Their body can be very, very stressed. They can start having hot flashes and night sweats. Uh, and then, you know, reproductive challenges, you know, vaginal dryness is, is a, a common challenge. And if we get the hormones right, all of that can be a very smooth progression. Right. So how how women can be could prepare themselves to go into those transitions, right? When these hormones start to change, then it's suddenly less of this, less of that. They're still menstruating. It's still not the menopause, right? But we know that they're already going through hormonal imbalances. And I know that there is a way they can optimize this. So actually they feel better and they can enter into transition in kind of the best possible body and mind and spirit, let's say. Well, what I, what I like to say is we should start right now. You know, Confucius mm -hmm. said the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. So whoever's watching this, they want to start today. And mm -hmm. I talk about the Magnificent Seven. You've got to eat right, drink right, think right, move right, sleep right, poop right, talk right. And every one of these things comes into play. So if we talk about eating for just a moment, if people eat more processed foods, if they spike their blood sugar, insulin at high levels is really the enemy of health. And when the body has too much insulin, it's going to store more body fat. 
Uh, when the body has more body fat, body fat is pro-inflammatory. That tends to be buffered by cortisol, the chronic stress hormone. When cortisol is high, that depletes DHEA, which is the precursor of the sex steroids. So diet is very important. Exercise is very important. Stress management is very important. And then we have to talk about toxins. You know, you talked about the bioterrain, which is a term I absolutely love. But we now have been studying toxins in humans for over 50 years, the human toxin inventory. They estimate that everybody has over 700 toxins in their body at all times. And many of these toxins mimic estrogens, estrogens in plastic, pesticide injected into animals. And it throws both men and women out of balance to the point where there's reproductive challenges, hormonal cancer related challenges, or if we get to females, we start looking at uh, heavy menstruation, menorrhagia, dysmenorrhea, pain during menstruation, endometriosis, fibrocystic breast, autoimmunity, depression. All of these are related to toxic estrogens in the body. So everything counts, but especially diet, exercise, stress management being the big three. Yes, because I'm asking this question because um, again I'm coming back to certain certain debates and I uh, interview like right now lots about the perimenopause and menopause and this transition women after 35 and uh, uh, there is that conversation you know let's uh, talk only about women uh, menopausal women let's throw them uh, HRT right and again I'm not against it's just that is the reality, right? That is the conversation we are having. That is the awareness, right? Women come to a simple, let's give, help them, sue them with uh, HRT. But then uh, we're forgetting that we not just starting our life at menopause, we are preparing and going towards this, right? So all what you say is matter. And uh, if you are 20, 40, 41, there's, there's no too late. So all what you said, that's what you see also in your clinical practice, that all these applications of modalities is going to improve symptoms. Yes, of course. You know, and, and I'll see, you know, girls in their teens that are having hormonal challenges mm -hmm. and we start having that conversation right away. You know, the medical model is, all right, let's give you a, you know, a, a drug, often the birth control pill. Uh, but now there's something called post-birth control syndrome where people don't recover, where they don't retain their fertility. But when you start looking at hormone replacement therapy, we can go back decades now uh, and very strong journals, the journal Carcinogenesis, which means the origin of cancer, says that a woman's lifetime risk of breast cancer is directly related to estrogen exposure. And most women have been exposed to too many estrogens you know, early in life, the estrogens and plastics, pesticides injected in animals. But if we do hormone replacement therapy, what we want to do is the lowest dose for the shortest duration. Now, I taught a series a few decades ago on menopause and hormone management. And there was an author named Joe Collins. He wrote a book called What's Your Menopause Type? And he made a statement. He said, estrogens, whether you make them, whether you take them, you need to get rid of them every day. And I expand that statement. Estrogens, whether you make them, whether you take them, whether you're knowingly or unknowingly intoxicated by them, whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, you need to get rid of them every day in a healthy way. So we have 11 different ways of clearing these estrogens, and some are pathways that tend to promote cancer, whereas others prevent cancer. So we want to do it in the right way. And cruciferous vegetables help with that. Good nutrition helps with that. Stress management helps with that. Idealizing body composition uh, helps with that. So everything works together. It's, uh, it's fantastic what you say, because <clears throat> I even haven't researched that. I've seen papers now come in and more practitioners talking about that. But I, uh, I have found correlation uh, through my clinical practice that women who experience um, weight gain or inability to lose weight, there is always a component where hormones are off in one way or another way, but there is always gut. They, they just come in together, right? And once you help one, then another one, and usually starts with, from the gut, then the biochemistry is like a happy, right? Let's change it, whatever is going on, right? Let's let's talk a little bit about um, this 
clearance of the estrogen. You said that there are different ways to clear estrogen because I want to debate a little bit this um, idea of estrogen detoxification because sometimes it's like you're hearing, let's detox, right? Let's cleanse estrogen. Let's use Dimaway. Let's use uh, uh, lots of different uh, uh, nutraceuticals to help clear estrogen. But the thing is, if the body is not prepared to clear estrogen, actually we can harm, harm more than this is worth because then once also the same uh, situation happened with use of the detoxification for fat loss, right? Of course. We can actually toxicate the body and make it people worse, right? So let's touch on it. What are the benefits of estrogen? Is a good hormone for female. Oh, it's essential, you know, and it's not just for women, it's for men too. For men so as well, yes. Yeah. Men's heart health, men's bone health, all very dependent on estrogen. But when we talk about women, we're talking about heart, we're talking about bone, we're talking about brain, we're talking about breast, we're talking about uterus, we're talking about reproduction, we're talking about all of life. Uh, and the right balance of estrogen is going to be wonderfully healthy for both men and women. But as estrogen begins to elevate and as the body doesn't clear it, what we tell people is that estrogen has a couple different functions. It's actually known as something called a, a mitogenic hormone. It causes cell division and cell growth. And that's one of the links to, to breast cancer. It also, by the way, when the body's not clearing it properly, it can be called what's mutagenic. So when we start looking at the 11 ways of clearing it, and I don't want to get too technical for your audience, but there's something called a 16 hydroxyestrogen, which is mitogenic, which increases the amount of cells in the body that can become cancerous. There's a four hydroxyestrogen that becomes mutagenic. But since the body has 11 ways of clearing it, if you have good liver function, then in, there's something that neutralizes the molecule. It could be something called glucuronic acid, sulfate, or even a methyl group. Uh, and by the way, bodies have challenges with all three of these. If the body clears it out, if you have good bowel function, you will get rid of the estrogen in a way that's very protective. But if you have the wrong bugs in your gut, we have more bugs in our gut than we have cells in our body. There's a species called bacteroides that can actually separate the fully detoxified estrogen and recirculate it through the system. So we need to have a good liver. We need to have a body which is not too overburdened with toxins because that'll deplete sulfate. We need to be able to methylate. About one in three people have a challenge with that. If you eat good fruits and vegetables, you tend to methylate better and can bypass that challenge. Uh, but ultimately, we want to make sure that the body's healthy, but the first rule of detoxification is to avoid putting toxins in. So if people eat organic, if people are making sure that their water is pure, if people are making sure that they're using all elimination routes, breathing, sweating, having bowel function, kidney function by drinking good fluids, then we can have a much easier time clearing these estrogens. Right. <clears throat> because what I have found that there is that interesting debate and conversation always on social media between nutritional therapies, dietitian, right? Or people who practice conventional and on the brackets, non-conventional, which is not really this, right? And they're saying, oh yeah, body can detoxify itself and all this detox practices and whatever are just rubbish. That is partly true if we are not looking into medical uh, sorry like medical application of the detoxification our body is the, able to clear everything is amazing but what you mentioned we're not living in the same world as tons of years many years ago uh, million years ago probably we are uh, thousands years ago we are um living in with more stress we are more indoor, we are moving less, air is toxic, we drink toxic water, everything penetrates our, have penetrated our life. So it's not the same. And that debate needs to a little bit change. And I think we should work together, like I said, in collaboration, because sometimes I feel like uh, I'm not talking science. <laughs> Well, you, you are talking science and you're ahead of it. And some people are just behind. So if we look at the global nutrition report, the number one cause of death on planet Earth in 2020 
was malnutrition estimated to be responsible for about 60% of all deaths in some way. When we start looking at that, a little over 100 years ago, scientists found out that they could grow big plants with three elements, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. But it takes 30 elements to make healthy plants, animals, and humans. And if you put three units in for every 30 units that you take out, eventually you're going to have a problem. And what we know is that the whole world has global mineral depletion. Now we start looking at the journal advances in therapy and they said, well, let's really see if this can work. So they took people's tissue, they biopsied it. They did a, an analysis of the nutrient value. And then they took two groups of people. Both were age matched, health matched. One group got a really good, organic, healthy, balanced diet. The other group got the diet and supplementation. 90 days later, they went back and relooked at the tissue and only the group that got supplementation was able to improve their nutrient status. So within that article, it said very simply, food by itself is too weak to replete depleted cells and bodies. Therefore, supplementation is advisable for everybody. Uh, and detoxification is nutrient dependent, energy dependent. Uh, and if we don't have the nutrients, we will not effectively clear the toxins so they will accumulate in our body. And we've documented that over the course of the last 50 years. Right. It, and, and that's why I'm saying we really, what we're talking about today is a cell biology. It's not just superficial thing. Give us supplements because that is prescription. What we're talking about is uh, about, we're talking about optimization of the cell function. So all the biochemistry, which is a big part of it, can really push anything we want through our human body, right? So um, like vitamin Bs, right? Uh, it is a great, you talked uh, about um, um, anticonceptive pills, right? And women, I just had a client just not far ago taking uh, anticonceptive pills for 13 years, right? And that is most female who takes uh, anticonceptive pills, they take in without break, without thinking that there is a depletion of nutrients and then they cannot get pregnant and then there is a problem with methylation and then we have a problem in, in the fetus and defects of that, right? Explain us a little bit more about this. Well, you, you use a different term than I use. I, anti-conception, contraception. It took contraception, me a little bit to yes. That, but what, what happens is very, very simply, I, and, and I'm going to tell a story. When I would teach doctors around the world, I would ask doctors that were trained, how does the birth control pill work? And the most common answer that I received was, well, it fools the body into thinking it's pregnant. Well, that's a very inaccurate statement. It disrupts the hormone balance so severely that the patient could not get pregnant if they wanted to, and many people never recover. So as they have these estrogens in the system, they deplete the B vitamins, especially vitamin B6, which is associated with PMS, vitamin B9 and vitamin B12. And those are the most critical for methylation, which is helping the body to repair the DNA. And we go back two decades ago and the birth control pill was added to the federal report on carcinogens. But it goes a step further. If someone gets depleted of these B vitamins, we methylate a billion times every second. That's how much we estimate. That's going to mask DNA. That's going to repair DNA. And if you don't methylate appropriately, you run the risk of cancer. You run the risk of cardiovascular disease. And these are the top two killers. Now, sadly, in my uh, base of people that I work with, and I saw people after the fact, I've seen a handful of women in their 30s that had massive strokes that they determined were from their birth control pills. Uh, and so, you know, you don't take something like that without paying a price. And if you're going to do that method of birth control, you want to maximize your nutrition, especially the B vitamins and the process of methylation. That's why we're making the point, because most women don't know this. I'm not even sure that most doctors know this. It, they may know, but it is, I had to remember, I had the, um, uh, the case um, actually, that was a doctor who came to me and I was helping her. And then uh, she was taking anticonceptive pills, 
But then she went and I said, you know, this is low. This is going to be low. This is going to be low. But then she went to and the chronologies and they said, this is just new form of peel. This the research that I have presented is from 10 years ago. Right. So this is what I'm saying. That is painful because um, we have the goal of giving women chance to be the best possible when they are 50s, 60s, 70s, so they can really live healthy long term. It's not just longevity. Who wants to live long and be unhealthy? No one, right? So that's why I'm saying I'm constantly stressing we should work together to then give the patients the best uh, outcome of both uh, worlds, right? So that's why my question now is how those women who take for 20, 15, 10 years, whatever, birth control pills are able to go well through perimenopause and menopause if they never been on a natural rhythm of female body. So does the body know really what it has to do? And then we're going to put them on another synthetic, HRT. So how can we, that's for me a little bit, doesn't make sense. <laughs> no, it doesn't make sense to me either. But so if we use the analogy of someone being very out of shape, they haven't exercised, they're overweight and, you know, they start, well, it's going to be a challenge for their body. But if they're very diligent, if they work with the right trainer, if they do the right things, if you look a year, maybe two years later, it will be a completely different person. Well, biochemically, we can do the same thing. And what we simply have to do is stop doing the things that are very, uh, bad for our body. And, and we could throw in the contraceptive pills in that category because it definitely creates imbalance, creates toxicity and start doing as many things right as we possibly can. And then if someone has a good customized evaluation, you know, there are different people that will need more methylation support than others. There are people that will need more insulin support, more anti-inflammatory support, more stress support. And if we look at what's unique about the person and we customize the program, that's where we get the best change. And, you know, one thing that I've taught people about biochemistry as well as nutrition, bodies respond to frequency, duration, intensity, quality, and timing of stimuli. Someone could go on a, on a very strong fitness boot camp and in 30 days be very, very different. We can do the same thing with biochemistry, but there's a price to be paid. Someone that's, you know, they're going to work hard in that fitness camp. They're probably going to be very, very sore we put someone on a biochemical change like that, well, they might have some nausea, they might have some diarrhea, they might have some headaches as their body detoxifies, but getting through it faster leads through quicker results, just a greater challenge along the way. So do you do you think those women around 35, and I know that they are a researcher about this, I think I studied at Anti-Aging Academy, um, with Dr. Smith, and she was saying that there are, I think, some research telling that up to 35 women is kind of, is the place where she should be taking and the contraceptive piece, but after 35 is something like that, I think she was saying, if she has to take, right, the best is probably not to take or use different way of, of conception, but if she has to take that age 35 seems to be that, uh, that, left the barrier when after that you should not be taking right well, so the risks, huh? the risks increase increase, increase. With year. yeah yes. ab absolutely and so you know the form of estrogen in the birth control pill is called ethanyl estradiol and it's 100 times stronger than human estrogen mm -hmm. so you look at this idea and realize wait a minute most women maybe all of them are estrogen toxic the estrogens and plastics like bisphenol a the metalloestrogens, lead, cadmium, mercury, tin, nickel, these aluminum, these are all found to have estrogen type activity. And then you, and even the insecticides, some of the herbicides, insecticides, fungicides have estrogen toxicity. You know, in the 1990s, a PhD researcher had made this statement, we are swimming in a sea of estrogens. If we go back and we can look at census reports in 1850 in the US, that's where we have, I think the best data, Cancer risk was less than one in 100 people, less than one in 100 deaths was related to cancer. Now it's about one in four deaths. And the most common cancers in both men and women are estrogen related cancers. Breast cancer is estrogen related, prostate cancer is estrogen related. 
And so we've created a big problem. So, uh, you know, 35, I would really like to start talking to women about more effective bio-friendly birth control pill from the very start. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what that's what she, kind of she was saying, right? Is if you have to, you don't have like a, because that's what women say. I want to take it, and uh, you know, and I'm going to take, right? So that I think she gave that that age thirty five. But again, as you said, at the same time, we have to make sure that our gut works well and that we are optimiz optimizing the removal of that uh, of that estrogen and what this can have. Uh, which consequence this could be uh, having later in life when women goes into uh, because then is the perimenopausal menopausal change the estrogen drops down but women still might have this bad estrogen in her fat tissue right well, let's talk about this so you know if we talk about the rise in autoimmunity that we're seeing what we know is that women have 75 percent of all autoimmunity now they've defined a uh, hundred plus autoimmune diseases here's a very simple statement from the medical literature that's indisputable estrogens promote autoimmunity whereas androgens protect against it so we're they're disrupting immune function now when you start looking at the body having challenges clearing the estrogen that is what's going to create the cancer risk. And, and those are the two biggest things, but we could start looking at weight gain. There's a lot of women that when they start taking the birth control pill, they might gain 10 pounds or five kilos, depending on what your unit is in that part of the world. And we know that estrogen increases a protein in the blood called thyroid hormone binding globulin. And instead of the thyroid hormone being free to act on the tissue and the metabolism and the energy, it's bound by the S, by the thyroid hormone binding globulin, and women can gain weight. When they gain weight, they're more inflamed. When they're more inflamed, they release more cortisol to buffer the inflammation. As they release more cortisol, they're less likely to make their own sex steroids. Uh, you know, a very powerful physiologic fact, you're either making stress hormones or sex hormones, not both. It happens at the level of the hypothalamus and the pituitary, so it's a very vicious spiral of bad happenings as the body gets out of balance. And instead of saying, okay, here's what we're doing wrong, let's make it right, they tend to add another medication. It might be an antidepressant, it might be a thyroid pill, uh, or whatever they need to the, to the uh, picture to make the woman feel better. But it's not the right answer. It's not the healthy answer. Yes, it's the same with progesterone when I see uh, women taking... Uh progestin right as a replacement and um the pro progest progesterone is um sitting on this uh, sorry corti cortisol is sitting on the same same on the same receptor site right and is blocking actually progesterone to be used is that correct right so then when they take in pills they are under high stress really that hormone cannot do its job first because it's a how how this work? <laughs> well, when we start looking at progesterone, one of the biggest challenges with too much progesterone is insulin resistance. Uh, and we see that with too much of this gestational diabetes. But anytime you throw the body out of balance, you, you start stressing the body and cortisol is the response. But one thing that I, I will tell you, and you said something about spending more time indoor. One of the things that we know is when we're exposed to artificial light, that's something that inhibits melatonin. And melatonin naturally is a buffer for cortisol. So with too much artificial light exposure, we get too much cortisol. We ultimately become cortisol resistant. And when cortisol doesn't do what it's supposed to do, the body says, wait a minute, I'm inflamed. I need more cortisol. It starts this whole drive of, of more cortisol, which further suppresses the sex steroids. So it really doesn't matter if you're throwing the estrogen out of balance, the progesterone out of balance, the insulin out of balance, even thyroid hormone out of balance, all of that causes a cortisol challenge. Right, and the cortisol, increased cortisol is a big problem when it comes to uh, fat loss, right? And that's what many women do not consider when they are going into another diet, another crazy exercise workout. And especially, uh, that's what I, at least I see women after this 35, 40, 
they carry on all these life experiences with them, which also cause increase the, of the cortisol. And, and then they go into the spiral of hormonal changes. And then they go in again on the same diet that they've done when they were like 20. <laughs> they go into the same workouts. And it, it's, I know that is depressing for them because they are not changing and actually they adding more into the fire. Well, you know, one of my top clinical interventions over the last really 20 years has been what I call a stress reset. Uh, and melatonin will bind to the adrenal glands themselves and prevent the brain from driving stress into the body. And I have people take melatonin every waking hour, just one to two milligrams that buffers the stress. There's an amino acid called theanine, which is in green tea. And theanine is what's called a GABA facilitator. So it's very, very calming to the mind. And then there's a superfood, which is known as reishi, also known as Ganoderma. And by multiple mechanisms, it actually drives the parasympathetic nervous system. It calms the brain and it reduces circulating cortisol. And therefore, the three of those combined, every waking hour for about 10 days can be life-changing for so many people. And I'll, I'll transition. I, I had my first patient, uh, it was a male, but over 500 pounds. 541 pounds is what he came in at. And when we did a stress reset, instead of consistently gaining weight, which he'd been doing for so long, he suddenly lost nine pounds in a very short period of time. And he just asked, how is this possible? Well, if we get cortisol right, there's so many mechanisms by which it will improve fat loss. So that could be a good starting point for many people. Yes, it's not just uh, for my, uh, female, because as you said, male going through these uh, changes, the, uh, is the testosterone decreases, other hormones like estrogen and progesterone also diminished. And they are, I think biology is, and human physiology is very clever. We need a little bit of everything. And then uh, we divide it into sexes, male and female. And we have a little bit more of this and a little bit more of that, because women need to know that they... And I'm actually going to transition a little bit into body composition because that is very underestimated longevity um, tool, but also hormonal resetting tool for females. And I think the notion of, and I'm repeating myself again from a few podcasts, so sorry about that, but I think that is so important because we are we have so amazing power next to us, like uh, building lean tissue, but also what 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 what, all, what women are doing, they are crossing this because they are worried that they're going to gain too much muscles and they're deserving themselves. And um, because you work with athletes and you know how this is important, and I'm sure you've seen in your clinic that women who are having better body composition, they are just hormonally more stable. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, when we start looking at longevity, we have a phrase here in, in the US, we talk about little old lady, little old man. We don't talk about big old lady, big old man. Why? Because big people don't get to be old. As you gain fat, you know, if we started in the younger years, as body mass goes up, as fat goes up, people become progressively more infertile. So obesity is part of the problem with infertility. But after, uh, you know, after menopause, it's a progressive problem where it's the number two risk factor for cancer. The number one risk factor is smoking. Number two is actually obesity. Well, when you start looking and we throw in the hormones in there, when people generate too much insulin with, with inappropriate diet or too much stress, insulin says store fat, don't break down fat. When there's too much stress, cortisol, cortisol breaks down lean and increases fat. Those two are very problematic. By the way, estrogen and progestin are very important for body composition, healthy body, body composition, the right amount of lean, not too much fat. And when women have a significant drop in that and they're not making it with endocrinology, that's why so many have weight challenges uh, after menopause. But body composition is a major indicator of overall health. And, you know, I don't know that in my 31 years of clinical practice, I've ever found a single female that was naturally too anabolic, putting on too much muscle. 
Uh, now, there are women that will supplement with anabolics. Uh, and by the way, they can cause themselves a lot of challenges by doing that. But I haven't seen the woman who naturally put on too much muscle. You know, God made some women to have a little more muscle. That's fine. You know, honor their body and their physiology. But too much, I've never seen it. I love what you're saying because I really want to keep convincing females to doing a weight training. And sometimes I feel uh, like I may be addicted, <laughs> addicted from talking about this. But uh, and I wasn't that way. I was an athlete. I would be tra- doing weight training, but in a sport environment, I wouldn't be like just purely focusing on on this. Now in my, uh, I'm 41. In that age is after uh, so many injuries, I've picked this as a, my main sport because uh, I was under the stress. I was breaking down a lot. I was continue training on an athlete at age 30 and I couldn't because I just had too much or what you mentioned, the, too much breakdown of the cortisol. And that was probably why I got an injury, right? Constantly in the catabolic stage, never in a repair uh, and rest. I was just upcoming uh, athlete and no one could stop me, <laughs> right? And you're training like crazy because you think that you are a machine, right? But that's why I'm, I'm talking, uh, start the weight training because there are so many benefits for it. Um, Let's talk about those benefits. Let's list down the benefits of weight training. You mentioned insulin, uh, improve insulin uh, sensitivity, which is a very big one. But let's explain maybe like in few lines, what is insulin sensitivity resistance and how this is going to help a female, let's say she's 35, why she should start weight training. Well, if we start with insulin, first and foremost, what we know is insulin rises, so does the probability of death. Uh, And so there's a factor called hemoglobin A1C. When people have A1C of 5.0, which is a very good number, uh, they have the lowest risk of death. But by the time they get to six, which is not yet even in the diabetic range, there's 28% increased risk of death from all causes. So we don't want insulin to go up because that creates a lot of problems. But when we start talking about building muscle mass, not only do we build muscle mass, we build bone mass. Uh, And that's going to be very, very important because bone loss is one of the biggest global problems. The risk of fracture goes up more so in women than in men with each passing decade. Uh, And too often, you know, women are getting a scan and, and they are told, well, you need this very harsh drug or these hormones because your bones aren't where they need to be. I've seen people put on as much as 18% bone density in a single calendar year with the right bone building supplements and the right bodybuilding weight lifting programs. Then when we start looking at musculature, most of the calories that we burn all day long and even in our sleep, up to 90% of those calories are burned by the metabolic activity of lean tissue. So the more, more muscle you have, the easier it is for your body to stay lean. The more muscle you have and the more leaner you stay, then the less inflammatory process you have created by body fat. We, you know, we can go back at several decades ago. We used to think fat just sat there, but no, it's got a number of chemical messages. They're called adipocytokines. And a number of those are pro-inflammatory. They increase inflammation in the body, which will then be buffered by cortisol which is gonna be bad for the hormones. But body fat has an enzyme called aromatase. Aromatase converts testosterone into estrogen and it creates certain levels of toxicity. Uh, By the way, this is an interesting phenomena. As men gain body fat, they become more feminine. As women gain body fat, they become more masculine because then they are actually transitioned more to an androgen type state. And what happens with too many androgens? They can get acne. They can start growing hair on their face. They can start losing hair on their head, things that they don't want to do. But, you know, the ideal body composition, the right amount of lean, and again, too much is is just not a practical concern, will help every aspect of life. Beautiful. And thank you for mentioning that it is not practical concern, as you said very nicely, uh, because... uh, it is very hard to stay lean all the time, right? So that is another thing. We don't need to drive towards being 
10%, 5%, right? We're not talking about this fitness competitions when you are having different physiques. We're just talking about this um, amount of lean muscle mass in relation to uh, fat mass that is going to support your health, keep you, uh, keep you younger longer, <laughs> right? Uh, lower all the inflammatory processes. And, uh, you know, you're just going to feel good about yourself overall, right? So that's what is the Mm, the purpose of of this uh, question bob tell me like three four key uh tips how female what she could do right to keep her um naturally and holistically healthy for for as long as possible <laughs> right a long question sure so i i talk about the big four stress toxins poor nutrition and physical inactivity. So if we deal with stress, we talked about the stress reset, but when people get connected to their purpose and something that goes beyond themselves, like you educating women all over the world, this is something that keeps you vibrant and young and motivated. And you know we need that level of motivation. So one of the best things for stress is knowing that we're getting better and that we're making our world better. When we start looking at toxins, it's no longer an option. We must do organic, you know, and I, I've, I've said for years, if God made it, and I'll quote Jack LaLanne, Jack LaLanne said, if God made it, it's okay. If man made it, stay away. We want to minimize processed foods because the more processing the food get has, the more likely we are to eat too much of it, the more likely it is to be pro-inflammatory, the more likely it is to cause insulin resistance. So eat a whole natural, clean diet lots of plants, you know, we are omnivores. So if I were to tell the full, and I, I will, my dietary guidelines are this, eat real food, clean food, not too much, not too often, every color, every day, in a way that honors your physiology, your genetics and your body goals, mostly plants. When it comes to toxins, don't put toxins in your system and make sure that you optimize all of your elimination routes. When we exhale, we're actually talk, uh, getting rid of toxins. So we want to make sure that we're breathing deep and cleansing our entire lungs. By the way, one of the best ways to breathe deep is to really push your body aerobically. Run hard, sprint, you'll breathe deep. Sweat, that's an elimination route. The lymphatic system requires movement and muscle contraction. We have our bowels, we have our liver and kidneys. Those all work together. We need enough water, we need enough fiber, we need enough neurologic tone. And we need to train ourselves to use the restroom uh, honoring our body. You know, there are, there are people that don't like to use the restroom in public. Uh, and I, I, I let them know that if your body needs to go, you need to honor that and go, or you could suppress those reflexes. Then finally, when it comes to movement, you know, I, I know quite a bit about movement. You know, I've got a, a degree in kinesiology. I've worked with great athletes, but I still hire trainers. Why? Because the right trainer for you can get you far more progress faster than you can get on your own. And, and so we all need a really good coach and why not have a good coach in terms of mindset, in terms of nutrition, in terms of exercise and in terms of overall life and health and wellness. I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of that. I also support uh, coaching because I see my own changes while I work with coach, right? Either is a business coach, either either is a mindset coach, either is nutrition coach. Uh, I went myself to uh, to naturopathic doctor when I needed, and this is what I also have learned about myself. And the thing is, if you are learning about yourself and your systems, you are always more aware, and it's much easier to keep yourself in this um, state of health for long. Uh, this optimum wellness and optimum health because you know you're actually aware right and uh, I really am stressing out as uh, Bob said how going to restroom is important and uh, that is one of the questions I always ask how is your bowel and keep observing this and keep watching this it is your physiology and um, that's powerful Bob you mentioned um, mostly plants I, I like this uh, but I have my thinking why you might be saying this. I want to hear from you. Why did you say mostly plants? Mostly plants. Okay. So, 
you know, there's a diet out there now called the carnivore diet. And there are people that have tremendous benefit from it. There's a speaker, Jordan Peterson, his daughter, Michaela Peterson, they turned around severe autoimmunity. Uh, and there's a reason for that. But when you look at our digestive tract, starting at the mouth, we have these things called canines, that's for tearing meat, but we have predominantly molars and that's for grinding plants, breaking down cell walls, absorbing nutrients. If you look at our entire digestive tract beginning to end, it's not a carnivore, it's not an herbivore, it's a hybrid in between. Uh, when we get plants, there's a lot of things that we get. Fiber is gonna be very important uh, then we start looking at these plant nutrients. So we have the fabulous 50, the vitamins, minerals, amino acids, proteins, carbohydrates, fat, fiber, and water. But there are 50,000 plus named plant chemicals. In fact, there's even a couple thousand named bioflavonoids, which by the way, are not considered essential nutrients, but they have profound health benefits. And when we start talking about plants, you know, years ago, they discovered something that they called forest bathing. When you just go and spend time in the forest, when you breathe in the, the chemicals that the plants are releasing, they're called phytoncides with the P-H-Y-T-O-N sides. Those are the plant's immune system and they enhance your immune system. And the emerging information about food is it's not just the, the macronutrients and the vitamins and the minerals, it's information. Uh, and if we eat a healthy plant that actually had to develop a strong immune system, we get good communication molecules. We get a lot of different anti-cancer benefits. And, and so this is data from one of the top published scientists of all time, a geneticist named Bruce Ames. People that eat the most fruits and vegetables eat, get the least cancer. Those that eat the least get the most. So they're critical in so many different ways, but we want a balanced diet. We want a healthy diet. We want a diet that has variety. Uh, and still mostly plants. Now the benefit of eating just meat for a short period of time, we have more bugs in our gut than we have cells in our body. And I tell people the bugs in our gut are actually vegans, they're vegetarian, they live on plant nutrients. So if you only eat meat, you will have the bad bugs in the gut die off. And for many people that can make a big difference. So there is a place for it, but it's not a forever place. It's a temporary place. Uh, some people like Michaela Peterson do so well that she kept doing it. It is uh, the same with a uh, food map diet. That's what is uh, when people are coming off all this um, prebiotic foods, right? Which are actually building the gut micro, supporting to uh, regeneration of the gut mi microbiome, right? They're getting better. They re they are symptoms are reduced. They're getting less bloated, less gases, less of everything, any kind of symptoms of um, digestive tract. But my al always question is, you still have, you need to have them. You cannot just deplete them completely. You because that's what I also saw on a test from people who is on uh, keto, right? And they just on keto purely because that's they they feel this works for them and etc. Right? So I am this type of practitioner. I am trying to give my my clinical view. What science said from one side, from the other side. But at the end of the day, the choice is patient's choice. I'm trying to optimize this and make this choice for them. So works for them in the best possible uh, way, right? But that's what I've noticed, the very low level of uh, any type of healthy gut bacteria. And that's actually, I have questioned, I've looked a little bit data and um, I found actually that is not long-term use of keto, it's going to do that. And question is, the, it is really healthy for us long-term to don't have in healthy gut bacteria. So, well, the gut bacteria, some call it the biggest organ in the body, and, and they create chemicals that are, are life critical. So there's, you know, something called the obese microbiome with the wrong balance of bugs in the gut. The bugs will actually create more fat to be absorbed by the body, a lot of extra calories. There's something called the oncobiome. That's onco being like oncology, the wrong balance of bugs promotes cancer. Uh, there's, you know, a depressive microbiome. There's bugs in the gut that can create very calming brain chemistry or bugs that can intoxicate the brain and cause big, big problems. So these can be a very important part of our health when we keep, get, have them in the right balance 
or a very important part of illness if we have them in the wrong balance. So people have good intentions to get rid of their bad bugs. But what I'd like to let people know is that here, at least in, in the US, 83% of antibiotics are used in animals, livestock, factory farmed meat, chicken, eggs, et cetera. And when we eat those foods, we get the antibiotics. The word anti means against, bios means life. These antibiotics kill the bugs in, a, in our gut and they're a big part of the problem. So if we eat organic, if we avoid antibiotics, if we avoid herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, then we can start getting the right balance of bugs. Uh, and you know, when someone has a really good healthy gut, the only thing their gut should tell them is I'm hungry, let's eat. I need to use the restroom. I need to go the rest of the day. They shouldn't even be aware of it. Yes, I like your approach and attitudes to that because I don't want to promote neither one type of diet, neither other one type of diet. That's why I like this mostly plants because that's also what I have seen uh, in research. And then we can start to differentiate and personalize our nutrition based on age, based on the nutritional needs, based on where we're coming from, based on our genetics. And uh, like someone would be great on more protein, someone great on a little bit more fat, someone great a little bit on more, more complex carbohydrates. But one common thing is we know that the low glycemic index fruits like berries are very well researched, the same uh, tons of quality of vegetables. And that's when I was doing also the, the Blue Zone book kind of guide me a little bit many years ago. And I was reading, there was, uh, sorry, I was seeing on YouTube, there was some uh, from university, I, again in U, uh, in the US, um, a professor was, a uh, female was doing like presentation and she went, she further dig down this um, nations from the blue zone and was exactly the words they she used mostly plant and meat was used in a very powerful way because was used as a spice so it was having fraction of meat was there in actually pretty high number of places who were living people were living long but it was used as a spice wasn't like my meat is most of my plate and the small amounts is like a vegetable right so um so that's why i really love what you said there is a p empowerment for people who is listening us that you at the end can start to listen yourself and see this is better proportion for me this is better proportion for me and what you said also uh, about the protein right that the animals if they are not uh, coming from good sources and they are all of the antibiotic is just probably I would suggest don't eat this meat either because it's not serving you at all and can hurt your um, microbiome and you're great about microbiome I listened to you uh, once and was uh, so powerful but we don't have time for it maybe maybe next time uh, Bob how can we find you where do you practice uh, you know what what your speciality is well, you know, I, I, my specialty, I'd like to say it's functional medicine, but I'm a chiropractor, kinesiologist, clinical nutritionist, acupuncturist. You know, my great mentor said, you want to help people with their chemistry. You want, to, you want to help them with their structure. You want to help them with their lifestyle. You want to help them with their energy. And that's been a really good combination for my patients. So my clinic's in Houston, Texas, but I, you know, I have two different websites that'll lead to me, thedrbob.com. So that's T-H-E-D-R-B-O-B.com or drbobrakowski.com. I'm also on Facebook and Instagram. And, you know, I love sharing consistently. I like to tell people I'm all about health, happiness, and success with certainly health first uh, and leading people to their best lives. Thank you so much. Um, it was short, dense, but uh, I hope you went uh, directly to the point and it's all about bringing more awareness. Uh, we're not going to treat anyone here within one hour, but it's uh, some food for thought for anyone and any female after 35 or after 40 who is listening to us once again thank you uh bob thank you everyone and uh, shall we speak and see again take care thank you so much